I'm Dr. Eric Bergson, and uh, I'm going to talk with you a little bit about thyroid surgery, uh, what's involved with thyroid surgery, some of the things that we think about uh, with thyroid surgery, and what uh, the experience might be for somebody, and um, you know what you might consider to be the risks of, of, of surgery, so to speak. These are things that uh, everybody who's doing thyroid surgery should be talking about with their patients and really something that everybody who's having thyroid surgery really just needs to hear about before they, they go forward. So uh, the thyroid gland, of course, is, is a gland that sits in your neck right about here. Uh, this is a, a series of pictures of the thyroid gland. Um, this structure here is what we call the larynx or the voice box. Uh, often you'll, you'll here it described as the Adam's apple. It's sort of the hard cartilage uh, part of your neck that you feel in the front. Uh, below that is the windpipe or the trachea. You see the rings of the trachea here. And the thyroid gland is, is sitting right, uh, right on top there. So thyroid surgery is done through an incision on the neck. Uh, typically, it's a horizontal incision. It's about right here. It's about that big. Uh, it typically heals very well. Uh, it, it, in a horizontal fashion, it, it, it will uh, blend in with the skin creases of the neck very well. And from a cosmetic standpoint, it does not typically uh, become a, a, a big source of uh, dissatisfaction, shall we say. Uh, it heals very well. Um, basically, there's two operations that we do on the thyroid. Uh, we remove one side of the gland uh, or we remove the whole thing. People often ask, can't we just remove one of the nodules and, and not remove that part of the gland? And, and the answer is, for a variety of reasons, it, it just doesn't work. Uh, you can't really just carve the nodules out from the surrounding tissue. It, it kind of makes a mess, and uh, if you ever had to go and remove another part of the gland, you'd have scar tissue and, and, and whatnot. So basically, it's either what we call hemithyroidectomy, meaning we remove half of the gland, or total thyroidectomy, meaning we remove the entire gland. Um, the surgery typically takes about two hours, an hour and a half to two hours for one side and closer to three hours if the whole gland is being removed. Uh, if, 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 uh, if one half of the gland is removed, typically we're gonna send you home the same day. Uh, if we're removing the whole gland, more commonly we're gonna keep you overnight for observation. There are some people who will send you home even with the whole thing uh, having been removed. Uh, you can sort of go either way. Right now, uh, I feel more comfortable keeping people overnight for one night after removing the whole gland. Uh, so when you think about uh, surgery, you have to think about some of the risks that are involved. And, and the risks uh, are, are very small, but they're not zero. Just like everything that we do in life, it carries some risk. So surgery, uh, risks of surgery typically involve risks to the surrounding structures. Uh, whatever structures live in the neighborhood of the surgery, uh, where the surgery is happening, those are theoretically going to be at risk uh, during the procedure. So if you're having surgery on in your intestines, uh, there may be some, some risk to your liver. If you're having surgery on your appendix, there may be some risk to your intestines, etc. Um, with thyroid surgery, basically have two issues to contend with. One is related to a nerve called the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and then the other is related to four little glands that live next to the thyroid gland. These are called the parathyroid glands. So uh, I'll start with one and then go to the other. Uh, the, 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 the voice box, the vocal cords, uh, the larynx, of course, is here above the thyroid gland, and inside the larynx are the vocal cords. The vocal cords uh, are, are sort of band-like structures that open and close. When you breathe, they open, and then when you speak, they close so that they can vibrate against one another. Um, and, and just like everything that moves in your body, it moves because your brain tells it to move by sending messages along nerves. So uh, if the person's brain were here, there's a nerve that comes down the side of the neck, right between the jugular vein and the carotid artery. I don't know how well you can see it, but there's a, a nerve that runs right down the middle between the two, all the way down into the chest, and then it sends off a branch. And that branch courses back up towards the thyroid gland. This is called the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and of course there's one on either side. 
And, and it's by that neural pathway that the brain tells the vocal cords to move. And since that nerve is tucked right underneath the thyroid gland as it goes into the voice box, that nerve has to be dealt with during surgery. The nerve has to be identified and preserved and protected as the, the part of the gland that you're working on is, is removed. Be because of that, there's some risk of injury to the nerve during surgery. Now, the risk of injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve during thyroid surgery is very low. Uh, permanent nerve injury, uh, like the nerve inadvertently gets cut, is extraordinarily rare. It happens with an incidence of, of quite a bit less than 1%. Um, you can have some temporary weakness of the, of the function of the nerve. We, we use the term neuropraxia in up to about 5% of cases or so, simply because the nerve can become a little bit irritated, a little pushed, a little pulled from the dissection, from the manipulation and the retraction involved with doing the procedure. Um, so what happens if there's, if there's an issue with the nerve? Well, since the vocal cords open and close like this, then what would happen if one side were affected is that that vocal cord could be stuck while the other one is moving, which would then not allow there to be good contact between the two vocal cords, and that can have an effect on voice. It can also have an effect on swallowing because the vocal cords coming together creates a seal that protects our airway from food and liquids going down the wrong pipe. So if we say then that the chances of really having a problem where the nerve gets cut is extremely low, less than 1%, what about this issue of temporary weakness? People can wake up with some temporary immobility or weakness of the vocal cord, again, just from the manipulation of surgery. And this is going to recover to normal in most or almost all cases over the course of a few weeks to a few months. Um, you could think of it like when you fall asleep funny on your arm and your arm goes to sleep and it feels strange and then it takes some time to come back to normal. So we, we, did, we take a number of steps to, to deal with this possibility to, to do the surgery in a safe and controlled manner. Uh, if a person wakes up with, with vocal cord weakness, it, it's frustrating and there's going to be an impact on the voice, uh, but it's not a disaster. Uh, it's going to typically recover, and although it can be frustrating, it, it's not the end of the world. However, if that were to happen again on the other side, that could be much more of a problem because if the vocal cords are stuck in a closed position, you're gonna have trouble breathing because there's no space to breathe. That can actually require a person needing a tracheostomy, which is a hole that we make in the airway in the windpipe below the vocal cords with a tube coming out through the neck. Now that sounds very frightening and nobody wants that, um, but we take some steps that you, I think you'll see make the chances of that happening almost zero. Anybody having surgery, under general anesthesia is going to have a breathing tube so that they can be connected to the breathing machine while they're under the anesthesia. That breathing tube goes in the mouth and then down into the airway. In thyroid surgery, we use a special breathing tube called an endotracheal tube. We use a special endotracheal tube that has a little sensor on it. And that sensor sits right at the level of the vocal cords. And so what happens is we go in to start the surgery and the first thing we do is identify the nerve and we touch it with a little nerve stimulator. And that sends a little electrical impulse up the nerve to the vocal cord, and it makes the vocal cord twitch. The sensor that's on the endotracheal tube picks up that twitch, and a monitor on the side of the room makes a beeping sound. And when you hear that beeping sound, you know that the, 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 the electrical circuit is functioning normally. Um, in fact, you can also stimulate the vagus nerve, which is kind of a higher point in the pathway to make sure that your signal is good. Then you then go and remove the side of the gland that you're working on. And then when you're done with that side, you then go and touch the nerve again. By touching the nerve again and getting your beeping sound, you know that the nerve is still functioning properly. And then you can feel comfortable to go to the other side safely. 
because you know that there's no chance of having a, 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 a both-sided bilateral paralysis uh, because your first side is, is working properly. If you don't get that beeping noise, meaning that there may be an issue with the function of the nerve, even though that may very likely be temporary, we typically, under most circumstances, will not go and operate on the other side on the same day. We'll just stop, allow weeks or months to go by till the, vo till, till the motion of the vocal cord comes back to normal, at which point we can then proceed to the other side because we know that the function of the vocal cord on the first side is normal. So our goal is to really decrease the chances of somebody having weakness or paralysis of the motion of the vocal cords on both sides. We want the chances of that happening to be just about zero because we do not want somebody to need even a temporary tracheostomy. So we use the monitor to guide our decision making about whether we can safely proceed with both sides of the surgery or perhaps we have to do what's called stage the operation which means stop, wait, and come back when the function has returned to normal. Now again, temporary weakness can happen, but it only happens about 5% of the time. So this whole issue doesn't really apply to the overwhelming majority of people, but I think you can see from the way we use the monitor and the way we think about the nerves that a lot of attention and focus is given and placed on managing the nerves and, and being careful about the function of the nerves as we make our decisions during surgery. The second issue or risk with thyroid surgery is related to what are called the parathyroid glands. The parathyroid glands are four small glands that sit on the back side of the thyroid gland. They're totally unrelated to the thyroid gland, except for the fact that they live on the back side of it. They're neighbors, but they're otherwise unrelated. The thyroid gland, of, of course, produces thyroid hormone, which is involved in your body's metabolism. The parathyroid glands uh, produce their own hormone called parathyroid hormone. Parathyroid hormone is involved in controlling your body's calcium level. So, when we do a total thyroidectomy, we have to manipulate all four of those little parathyroid glands away from the, the thyroid. We want to leave those parathyroid glands in place uh, as we remove the thyroid gland. Now, these are delicate little glands with a, uh, a delicate little blood supply, and they don't like to be manipulated. Uh, so it's very common. Probably 50% of people will experience a temporary decrease in their parathyroid hormone production uh, after total thyroid surgery. And that can result in a temporary decrease in the body's calcium level. Uh, and so in anticipation of that, we pretty much put just about everybody after total thyroidectomy on some calcium and vitamin D supplements. And we expect, I expect that you're going to be on that for about a week or two. Uh, then in the office, we'll do some blood work, <clears throat> making sure everything is, is stable, and then we'll get you off of the calcium and the vitamin D. Some people won't need it at all, but it's routine to, to expect to take calcium and vitamin D for about a week or two afterwards. Any kind of problem with long-term low parathyroid level called hypoparathyroidism and, the, and therefore the need to, to be on calcium and vitamin D long-term is very uncommon there you're in that 1% range or so. Um, so those are the two main issues regarding thyroid surgery. Um, other than that, uh, there's basic wound care, there's usually a steri strip over the incision, stitches are usually dissolvable under the skin, we take the steri strip off after a week. Um, sometimes in surgery, whether it's in the thyroid or other parts of the body, uh, will leave what's called a drain. There's a tendency for the body to uh, fill a space where something used to be with fluid, and the drain will pull that fluid out. Probably use a drain about 25, 20 to 25% of the time with thyroid surgery. Uh, it's much more common with a very large gland uh, than with a smaller gland. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's sort of a judgment call as to whether you, you use it or not. Uh, if we do leave a drain, it typically comes out the morning after surgery. Uh, it's a little 
off-putting for some people to have this little tube coming out from under the skin connected to this little suction bulb, but other than a, a being a, a bit annoying, it, it's not that big of a deal. Most people are going to go home the next day after surgery, after the total thyroidectomy, and the same day of the surgery after the, 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 the hemithyroidectomy. Um, basically, with the total, we're looking for the calcium levels to be nice and stable before we send you home. Uh, after surgery, you can eat and drink whatever you want. You can shower the next day. Your activities basically are, are up to you. Whatever you feel up to doing is basically fine. Uh, if you have your whole thyroid taken out, of course, you will need to take thyroid hormone replacement because uh, you need thyroid hormone to live. Um, it would take weeks before you, you know, started to develop a problem, but suffice it to say that after you don't have a thyroid anymore, you need to take medicine to replace the hormone. In the, in the setting of a partial thyroidectomy, a hemithyroidectomy, if you have normal thyroid levels before surgery and we remove half of your gland, probably about 70-75% of people are going to do fine without the need for any medication, which means that perhaps about 20-25% of people will require thyroid supplements because their levels become a bit low with the loss of half of the gland. Um, uh, people will come back to see me uh, in about a week. Of course, you'll have a prescription for some pain medicine. The level of pain after thyroid surgery is kind of moderate. It's not terrible. Uh, some people will get by with just Tylenol or Advil, but uh, you will have some stronger medicine in case you need it. Um, as far as work, people will typically take one to two weeks off of work. Occasionally, people may find they need longer. Occasionally, people may find that they're back at their routine a little sooner, but of course, everybody's different. So that's a, 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 a basic discussion of, of thyroid surgery. I think I, I covered most of the, of the big issues. There's, there's always more that can be discussed, but I think that that's the, the basics. Uh, I hope that was helpful, and um, thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.